and welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I am Luke. And Melissa is probably still muted. So who are you again? <laughs> I'm still Melissa. Still here. Still, still Melissa. Still Melissa. Still Perfect. Yes. Which is who I was hoping would be here. Uh, but we are here talking about Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Chapter number 28, The Madness of Mr. Crouch. This chapter is 29 pages, and that's almost 4% of this book. 3.95% of this book. Bench, tell us what happened. The trio send a letter to Percy with little hopes of a response. They then head to the kitchens and give Dobby several new pairs of socks for his help with the gillyweed. The elf is ecstatic and the others are happy to see and serve them. Well, that is all except for Winky, who is sitting in the corner covered in filth, miserable and drunk on butterbeer. She drunkenly says her master needs her to help with his secret. Hermione is upset that the other elves for not helping her and shunning her away. On their way out, they grab a good amount of food to send to Sirius. At breakfast, Hermione starts to get multiple owls of hate mail for breaking Harry's heart and even gets one filled with boober tuber pus which covers her hand causing her to flee to the hospital wing. In Hagrid's class, he teaches them about nifflers and Ron collects the most leprechaun gold but is upset when he finds out that it vanishes because that's what he gave Harry in repayment for the omnioculars. Ron is embarrassed about being poor and Hermione is upset about the fallout from what Rita wrote. They discuss how she could be getting her information and Harry suggests maybe she has someone bugged and Hermione shoots him down because that's not possible within the castle grounds. After Easter, the champions are summoned to the Quidditch pitch and learn the third task will be navigating a giant hedge mage facing his challenges and retrieving the cup in the center. On the way back to the castle, Crumb pulls Harry to the side and confronts him about being involved with Hermione. Harry assures him that they're just friends and when they're approached by Mr. Crouch coming from the forest, he's confused and seems to be talking to several people at once. In a moment of clarity, he tells Harry he needs Dumbledore. Harry tells Victor to stay with him and he goes to get the headmaster. After being stalled by Snape, Dumbledore finds him and gets the information about Crouch. The two head back to where Harry left Crouch with Crumb and only find Crumb stunned. After he's woken up, Crumb tells how he was attacked by the crazy old man. Hagrid and Moody arrive, followed by Cockroft, who accuses Dumbledore of shenanigans, infuriating Hagrid. Moody heads off to search the forest for Mr. Crouch. Harry is sent back to his dorm under Hagrid's supervision and told to remain there all night. Hagrid warns him about associating with foreigners, such as Crumb. Alrighty there, Melissa. Uh, what kind of... Char Do we have any character introductions this chapter? Did you see anyone new? Well, there's something new. I'm going to call it a character. It's a it's a living thing. Mm -hmm. This is a, a is, borderline magic vocabulary. <laughs> yes, but it's adorable and useful. It's a Niffler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Nifflers? You used adorable already, so I guess it come is up adorable. with another ad adjective. Well, so, so my first thought was going to be, oh, I want one. Then I was like, wait, hold on, animals. That's Ugh. specifically something they talk about. <laughs> <laughs> right like oh maybe we shouldn't get one of those but like i, I just i can't imagine it being very practical mm -hmm. your own money like that's not helpful right right say like, well i already have a dog that destroys my house do i really want another little pet that is specifically designed <laughs> to basically do that like ah no i don't think so yeah, I'm probably I'm probably good. They're very cute from afar. If I was, you know, like a like a spy or you know some kind of criminal, seems like it'd be a pretty good uh, tool to have. You know, a good partner in crime if you could like befriend one, but not That'd to really train. Yeah, not to really live with necessarily. No, they would need a handler. Yes, yes, very very much. Uh, did we go anywhere new in this chapter? Nope. We stayed in all the same places. Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of Quidditch pitch, pre-hedge maze, kind of. And then, like, we don't know if we've been specifically to this specific exact location at the edge of the forest. I, but, uh... I, I'm gonna go with, you nitpicky, it's the forest. We've been right, there. we will pick nits later. <laughs> so, what yeah. kind of magic... Today is not that day. <laughs> Thanks, Aragorn. Uh, what is the magic vocabulary from this chapter? Well, we have some hex deflection happening, or discussion thereof. Mm -hmm. That was one of those, it's a pretty broad term, but 
they specifically say we're studying hex deflection. I thought it was worth uh, putting in there. Yes, I'll go with that. All right. So we do have, just like every single chapter, a chapter oh. illustration. <laughs> and you've got it there. Look at that. You've already got it pulled up, too. I do. It's adorable. Actually, it's really depressing. It looks kind of kind of creepy, really. It's like it makes me sad because it is winky in, her, in the drink. In the drink. Mm -hmm. um, she's drinking but not really knowing much, and <laughs> it's not doing so well for her. Yeah, no, she, has a, she has a rough chapter, I'd say. Yeah, I, and like I feel for her because she just wants to be with her Mr. Crouch. Not that he deserves her, but that's what she wants. Yeah, I, it's interesting to see like the one big sock hanging off her foot is very Dobby-esque. You know, just right. pointing to the clothes, like making the clothes like a very specific thing. It's not just the tea cozy. And like even yeah. even her dress, like which we talked about before, you know, Dobby, he, he's got all of these really extravagant things and um, he takes such good care of them. But he's also, you know, worked for them and afforded them himself for the most part. He's been given a few things from from Harry and such. But um, like Winky has has that one really nice, you know, elf clothing item like we talked about and she's not keeping it up very well because of her pretty decent depression that she's going through right so i think that's interesting that that kind of shows up here as well yeah it, it makes me sad for her All right, Melissa. So this was a bit of a longer chapter. Not not the longest ever, but a lot seems to happen. I, I thought I thought they got a lot covered here. Uh, what was your first note? What do you got? Okay. Here? So you and I had a bit of a disagreement on perspective on this on the last chapter, but I had to bring it up because it happened again. Hermione receives some mail. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to call it troll mail. Much, much as one might troll in the comments of a, oh, I don't know, YouTube video or Facebook post or Instagram post, Hermione's being trolled. This is what's happening. And Ron victim shames her again. It bothers me. He's like, I told you, you shouldn't have done. Like, she didn't do anything wrong. She's already getting hate mail for it. And now her friend is victim shaming her. And I just am annoyed by him for that. He's His bias is showing a bit throughout this section and this is an example of it and it kind of bothers me yeah i i think that's pretty reasonable again i, I never really thought about it that way um which i am certainly ignorant of certain things and so i can see why ron would be doing what he's doing you know I, i'm not condoning it but i can see where he's coming from for sure and i think you're right to kind of call him out on it hold on wait i'm right it's well, been so a while you're right all the time okay you're only right if you disagree with me <laughs> <laughs> you've said that i'm quoting you i'm quoting you know, specifically but here's the thing last time you disagreed with me on this exact point and here you are agreeing with me so what? this actually counts as being right yeah as opposed to just the general rightness that we usually both are that's fair i will concede I, this, this point time, entirely I be more right i will concede this point entirely <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's all I got. I win. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This has been Melissa. Thank you. It's going to be me for the rest of the episode. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Melissa's met her quota. Uh, no, so it's a good point for sure. And again, I just never really thought about it that way. Um, and I'm sure he doesn't. You know, he doesn't actively think that. And I don't even know if she would recognize it as that without being just upset by it, but not really thinking bad of him for doing it the way he is. You know, it's just kind of, she would realize his ignorance and not, like, hold it against him, I think. Right. Like, she would just think he's being ignorant, not realizing that that's a... Exactly, yeah. Like, a systematic bias that's mm -hmm. ingrained in society. They, It's just not... It wasn't prevalent then. It wasn't... That knowledge base wasn't there. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's it's totally fair. Totally fair. Mm -hmm. um, so what else, what else you got here? We, we've both got quite a few notes in this chapter. So I think you've got something that kind of goes along with the Hermione hate mail thing. If okay. You wanna... Yeah. So this, this kind of comes down to um, it kind of jumping ahead in the chapter a bit, right? You know, when they're talking to Hagrid and, you know, Hermione's getting her hate mail and, you know, Hagrid finds out about it too. And he's like, you know, I got plenty of that and it, you know, it's really awful and just don't let it get to you. And like the stuff he was getting was, was just terrible. You know, like, mm -hmm. wow, your, your mother was a, 
an awful killer, like go throw yourself off a bridge kind of stuff, which is just terrible. Don't be that person uh, in general. That's I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life, but don't be that person. Uh, right. it's, it's, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you this. But I'm going to say it's it's frowned upon uh, for, from us here at the podcast that dot com at least. Um, That's true. And right along with that, you know, Mrs. Weasley's measly, I, I thought that was a funny way of putting it, mm-hmm. uh, Easter egg for Hermione is a bit shallow of Mrs. Weasley. Like, I've never really had her colored in that light other than, I guess, like, the Lockhart stuff in book, too. But, you know, that was always just kind of, like, silly. And, oh, Mom fancies him. And so, like, it's not, like, it's not a big deal, but, like, here she's, like, reading the gossip stuff and she's just acting catty about it. And I, it's, come on, you're... You're adding on to this bullying that's happening to a child that's best friends with your fr- with your son. Like, come on, Mrs. Weasley, that's that's not a good light for you. I have such a problem with the egg. Yeah, to me, th- this one bothers me way more than Ron. I think is that is that fair? Only in the point that Ron is a dumb kid, and and here's the thing. And he is. He, there is, are... he is a dumb kid. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he is. I... I am not discounting the fact that Ron is super dumb and completely oblivious and does not know about emotions or feelings or other people or... He's got a teaspoon, all right. Anyway. (laughs) And there are adults in this world who are not perfect. One comes to mind, Severus Snape. But even beyond him and his horribleness in this book in particular, like Trelawney has issues and Lockhart had issues and Quirrell had issues and there are others and Fudge has issues. And Every Death Eater. But, uh, everyone on that. But yes. Like, and even like a lot of the somewhat decent adults we meet have some faults because that's what humans are. But Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, like they're the parents, right? Like they're, they're the pedestal. They're the, person you aspire to and for mrs weasley's fault to come out in this way in such a a a biased and petty and vindictive way over something she read in a magazine like she's taking the word of a magazine over what she knows about this girl and it's not just some friend of her sons it's somebody that she's welcomed into their home somebody they've brought on trips with that like this is a good family friend. Where is she defending that good family friend? I, I don't know. I, I I can't explain it better than that. It just, like, this is a core issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I you, you're hitting on all the same things that bother me with it, for sure. I mean, this is, they know each other. You know, they, they know Hermione. Mrs. Weasley mm-hmm. knows her, like you very well put. And it's different from... If they o- if it's somebody that only read this and you know had the heartstrings for you know this poor boy Harry, if they think back to the other article written about it, right. I mean, sure, you know, like you know the darling Harry Potter, you know, helpless and all of these and thrown into all this stuff without doing anything, and like if you just sap all that up, like from that perspective, and then you read this about Hermione, like I can I can understand that. Like, I can understand where some of the other hate mail comes from. I, I don't like it, but I can see where those ignorant people are coming from. This, you know Hermione. And on top of that, you know Rita Skeeter. You specifically said earlier in this book, because everyone lives their life one book a year. Uh, that's right. I'm, I'm on book 29, coming up on 30. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> earlier in this book, she specifically was talking to Amos Diggory, right? And she said, you know how awful... Rita Skeeter is like, you know, like it, I feel like that conversation happened, right? That she, are, she knows how awful Rita Skeeter is. Yes. Yes. Like you of all no, people know how terrible she's, you know, Rita Skeeter is. So and, why are you letting that cloud your judgment of somebody who right, you know personally? Right. I just, it, it seems very out of character. I'm very surprised. I almost by this choice by, by JK to, to have Mrs. Weasley fall into it. And I'm a little let down by it. Like, I don't yeah. know if it's ever really bothered me this much, but it it's just like, come on. Like, really? Really? You're going off of this right. one very clearly gossipy article? Like, get out of tabloid nonsense. Get out of here. Come on. Right. It, it's just, it's disappointing. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I'm a little mad, too. Okay. I'll be, I'm okay with being a little mad about this one. Okay, Mom. <laughs> right. I get that from Dad more often, to be fair. Oh, I got it from Mom. <laughs> that makes sense, though. Um... Yeah, so that, that that's kind of a, a theme throughout this whole 
this whole chapter we kind of covered a few different things there so um i guess we can keep on hagrid for a little bit there's a couple yeah, things let, going on let, there let's, let's stay on hagrid i have like i really only have i feel like hagrid shows up in a variety of places throughout the chapter so i feel like we should do all the hagrid let's now. hagrid it up <laughs> hagrid it up so my my one positive hagrid comment is that hagrid called out goyle for stealing all of the gold mm -hmm. at the end um, I really like that Hagrid's teacher eye is improving a bit. Oh yeah, I was I was very impressed with that. He's he's having a conversation about something else, you know, kind of instructing class, and he still sees <laughs> that probably in the back, and he just realizes it, just calls it out nonchalant. You know, it wasn't like a big deal. He was just like, oh, don't even don't even worry about it. It's it's leprechaun gold. But he noticed and he called out the kid. Like right. I, I would mark that as like a good observation keeping control of your class yeah by by yeah. don't worry about it i meant goyle like and don't waste right, your right, time right. that's how i meant that but yeah i agree good on hagrid for sure um also in this chapter he's pretty cool toward uh madame maxine and uh i i like that you know i, I think he says i've got her number uh or is that I'm, I'm trying to find the line i'm sure i have it highlighted um because again he's in here a couple times so i'm flipping through quickly Oh, it's at the very end, I believe. When um, he's talking to Harry as they're walking. Right. Uh, I'll be having... And he's trying to yell it. He's yelling at Harry about talking to Crumb. Yeah, yep. Yeah, you were getting all right. You were getting on all right with Madame Maxime, Harry said, annoyed. Don't you talk to me about her, <laughs> said Hagrid as he looked. And he looked quite frightening for a moment. I've got her number now, trying to get back into me, old, into me good books. Trying to get me to tell her what's coming in the third task. Ha! You can't trust any of them. So, one, yeah, like, it, from his perspective, sounds like Maxime is trying to use him. That's not cool. But I also want to throw in Hagrid's uh, seeming prejudice showing up again. Um, it's not the first time. Last time we brought it up and you were like, oh, no, it's not a big deal. It was against the Dursleys uh, about his muggle. Uh, ignorance. I feel yeah. like a bit of that is translating into this uh, xenophobia a little bit. And yes, it's again a very specific condition that he's talking about, but he's also throwing Crumb under the bus, who's done nothing wrong. Nothing like, wrong. Like, that's where it's kind of like, okay, that's a little too much. Be upset at the Dursleys for everything you might know about them. Be upset mm -hmm. at Maxime for your own personal entanglement, whatever frustrations you have with that, fine. But the way he throws Crumb and just, you know, he, he says, Something about the whole lot. You can't trust the whole lot of them. You can't trust any of them. Like that's that's pretty self-focused, self-centered, and I and like closing ranks. Like here's yeah. mine, and and I don't want anything to do with yours. Right, right. So it, it doesn't seem very fair to me um, for Hagrid to be saying the things that he's saying, especially to Harry, right, who has to like compete, but also has you know all the other crazy going on. So. Do you know there is another point where he actually, we we observe Hagrid being talked to by Madame Maxine. Yeah, there's a quick, I think that's yeah, what my he, original note was. He was out shoveling. Um, yes. And, and when we're up in the owlery. He's kind of disinterested down. and they don't right. talk for very long. So yeah, it, oh. so he was in, yeah, three, three or four scenes in this chapter, Hagrid was. It was a Hagrid heavy chapter. That sure was. All right. So one more Hagrid thought from me. When Bagman was introducing our, our champions to the hedge maze, he was saying that there's going to be all sorts of things they have to get through in the maze. And some of them is going to be, oh, Hagrid is providing some creatures. Mm -hmm. How wise is it to put Hagrid in charge of creature choice for the maze? Very wise. Okay. On a scale of like idiotic to best move ever. Oh, come on. I know I was just dig it into a little bit but i think I know. he knows his, his his content pretty well he knows what's going to be challenging but doable um but it needs to be challenging if this is the final task if this is the final task for seventh years for champions i mean it, unfortunately harry's in there but this needs to be yeah, difficult okay. this needs to be tough but see it's not mission difficult mr hunt it's mission impossible <laughs> or at least it would be if hagrid wasn't i just think hagrid's view of what's doable but hard is skewed even more than it needs to be. That's me. Yeah, I can see that, but I, I think that's exactly what... Because in all fairness, the dragon, one-on-one, -on -one, they all did pretty well. Could have been more Good difficult. Point. The Maybe underwater, we'll have a, a 
Like there were certainly creatures in there. Seems like it's all been pretty creature focused. The all three. Which means we might need more creatures. That's what I'm saying. Like it. A flock of dragons. Who knows? What do you call a group of dragons? A herd? Um, I don't know what the plural version, like the the group uh, of dragons, would be. Um, group of dragons. Is, Google is known as. Nothing. Let's see, let's see what Quora.com says. <laughs> Uh, a common term uh, is a thunder of dragons. I like that. Uh, a flock of dragons, a horde of dragons, a clan of dragons, tribe of dragons. I like a thunder. I like a thunder of dragons. That's. Uh, there's also a battalion of dragons, a unit, a legion. Uh, gotta... In a maze, it's a battalion of dragons. A what? In, in the maze, it might be a battalion of dragons. See, the ranges of the dragons, the thunder might be like the family grouping. Mm-hmm. Apparently there's also, it's been the term of aware, a W-E-Y-R, which is similar to like wyvern. Like I can certainly see where that's coming from. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with, with thunder is, is my accepted answer at this point. Uh, listeners, if you have a preferred dragon grouping choice, please write it in at not named podcast on Twitter or on Instagram or send us an email. That was a fun topic. Let's just talk about dragons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, this is not the Norbert chapter. You gotta let it go. I missed that chapter. It, it, I no, look, I don't. look back on it fondly, actually. Just remember for how, how annoyed we were. I know, I know. But like, if we were to go back and do it right now, I'd be like, "Oh, this is fun. Like, it's okay. Whatever." Hey, remember when this was the hardest thing they had to deal with? <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Man, that was that was kind of the crux of our really being disappointed at Hagrid. Like, uh, and really, I. I, I'm not really hating on Hagrid in this chapter. I just think his prejudice was a little bit much. I think he has some other really strong points in this same chapter, what you have already brought up for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, how he kind of, again, kind of reassures Hermione. I think he did a good job of that last time. Maybe problematic mm -hmm. when she was called the Mudblood before. Uh, listen to AccuPolitics episode on uh, Mudbloods and Murmurs for more on mm -hmm. that. For sure. That was eye-opening for me um, for what they talked about. So definitely check them out. But okay, it. so it looks like you have a note about Sirius before we jump to the other maze discussion. Yeah, yeah. So this is very much towards the very beginning of the chapter. And, you know, I, I think it was a good job for, for Harry to, you know, I guess the group as well. But I think mostly Harry is in charge of this one of getting and sending food up to Sirius. You know, it's mm -hmm. they didn't just bring him food that one time. He's literally going out of his way to to send off more food right now and uh this this chapter opens up in the in the kitchens right and they're talking they're going, to yes. they're, and because they're giving, giving dobby his um thank you for saving my life socks. Socks. yeah and so then they and ask then they, for food and yeah. hermione's like you know whatever whatever because she's not loving it or whatever but um harry at least does get food for Sirius sends it up he's tired of them bickering i think and so he goes by himself to the owlery is that right <laughs> Yes, and um, the the I just think like the the image of three owls flying off carrying an entire ham, a whole ham, along with the other food, would be pretty noticeable. Like we're trying to be really stealth, getting serious, you know, not found. Mm -hmm. He's being covert. You send a, this whole flock, a peck of owls, if you will, and um, it, it's just a little noticeable, but still good on Harry for getting the food. Okay. So I just thought it was worth noting. Yep, I, I agree. It was a little bit of a bad choice on their delivery method. Like, they could have sent the ham and then another package of the other food. <laughs> but at the same time, nobody knows where it's going. Yeah. Like, I was flying in and out with random things probably all the time. So nobody's going to question that. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a, a whole discussion at some point for us to have on more of the mechanics of how Outpost works. Maybe that's a must not tell lies uh, full episode, but to go into depth, uh, which hopefully we'll be getting more of those episodes coming out soon. Um, the podcast that must not tell lies for magical theories and fan theories. So keep an eye out for those when they get out. And so in that same Niffler scene that we kind of already chit chatted about, kind of going back to the Goyle stealing the leprechaun gold, uh, Ron finds out, I guess we all find out that, you know, Leprechaun Gold vanishes, you know, within a few hours, and Ron's pretty upset at just the idea that Harry 
didn't realize that, uh, you know, the galleons that he gave him paying back the Omnioculars vanished, you know, and he's, this is the line, you know, it must be nice, you know, not being able to realize a few galleons going missing, and Harry's like, I had other things on my mind, like, it was not, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but Ron's okay. just, right, <laughs> he's, I think, pretty justifiably upset Ron is, you know, because, but, I mean, again, this is one of those, they're both right from their own perspectives, and mm-hmm. Ron is just still like that, having a very difficult time with being raised in a poor family like that he just has a hard time with that and uh i i don't know if it's unreasonable for him to be upset no i don't think so i think i probably would have felt the same in that situation because it's hard not being able to have the basic kinds of things that everybody else around you has i'm not asking for like super fancy things but like everybody has a pair of adidas shoes it'd be nice to also be able to have a pair of adidas shoes mm-hmm that's all I mean. Right. And, I mean, yeah, Harry is loaded, right? I mean, we, we know that. I mean, yeah. he's a, a fortune. And Hermione, I didn't, even though it was on the muggle side of things, didn't grow up, you know, down in the dumps at all. I mean, both of her parents are dentists. They're doing all right. Right. Um, so, with his two best friends being that way, and only children, so it's not split at all, right. I, can un- I can certainly see where some of Ron's envy kind of comes from. Mm-hmm. and. It's not like he's mad at them specifically. He's more just upset at the situation. And it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I, there's nothing I can do about this, at least now. So I, it's just something I, I can kind of see as being reasonable from Ron. Yep. I agree with you completely. Uh, right along with that, uh, we also have Ron showing some major interest in muggle technology, right? Do you have that line at hand? Oh, let me see if I can find Let's it. See if I can find it as well. Uh, oh, I thought I, I'm sure I highlighted it. Oh, it's about being bugged. Here we go. Yeah, that's right. Uh, No, said Hermione stubbornly. I want to know how she heard me talking to Victor and how she found found out about Hagrid's mom. Maybe she had you bugged, said Harry. Bugged, said Ron blankly. What, put (laughs) blue or something? Harry started explaining about hidden microphones and recording equipment. Ron was fascinated, but Hermione interrupted them. Aren't you two ever going to read Hogwarts a history? (laughs) What's the point, said Ron. You know it by heart. We can just ask you. <laughs> oh, and that right there, those two lines, higher friendship. But oh. back to your point about muggle technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think it's nice that we see a little bit of an echo of Arthur Weasley's fascination. Like, this is clearly like the Ron grew up with that being kind of like a cool thing, you know, and they make fun of his dad, you know, tease him, I should say. Mm-hmm. They tease his dad for his obsession or whatever, but clearly some of that's rubbed off because... Or maybe it's just innately Harry, Ron's interested in it as well. But I just thought it was a nice little throw in of, you know, this would be interesting to Ron. You know, it says all those substitutes for magic, muggles use, electricity, computers, and radar, and all those things, they all go haywire around Hogwarts. There's too much uh-huh. magic in the air, which, yeah, tons of thoughts about that that is not for this episode. Um, but just, again, nice job, Ron. I'm, I'm glad that he was fascinated by electricity. I'm glad he had some highlights in this chapter. Right, right. He, need, he needed a little help after uh, more victim shaming, huh? He did. He needed an uptick because <laughs> it's been not so good. Hey, guess what? What? We get to we, we get to go with Bagman. Bagman. Mm-hmm. And I like that it's Cedric and Harry going together. Like they've they buddied up and they're walking together and they're chit chatting. And and Cedric lets Harry know about something he was discussing with Fleur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Fleur was thinking, Fleur, 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 was thinking that the last challenge would be going down into an underground tunnel, uh, which apparently she's read the Harry Potter books, because that's literally (laughs) what the first three books have been. Like, hey, let's end up in some form of underground tunnel. Uh, It's the most reasonable option. (laughs) (laughs) So far, it's the only thing we do. Uh, Right. Either we're going down into a chamber of secrets, we're going down into a magical obstacle course we're going down underneath the uh shrieking shack you know it's there's always an underground tunnel (laughs) that's right there is always an underground tunnel so i mean three for three so far fleur uh, she's playing the odds right oh yeah oh yeah that's that's good bet i just want to say did we know that fleur and cedric were chummy enough to be having conversations about the upcoming task who knew they were friends um i think it's one of those like i'm sure there are certain times where you know, it's just the the champions around. Harry is not really going to instigate a, a conversation with with her. Crumb is kind of to himself. 
like they're the only two that would be talking unless it was Cedric and and Harry, or if it was Crumb and Fleur being like, "Wow, this place is weird, huh?" <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing: I actually bet that they talk more than even just oh, in passing. Like, I could Cedric is a really well known, outgoing, friendly guy. Yeah, and yeah. Fleur, after her like humbling, like knock herself down a few pegs, task two mm-hmm. maybe is being more friendly toward the other kids in the school maybe they're in a class together maybe they are you know, like there really could be more of a friendship happening yeah i really point. wish they would touch more on just the idea that you brought up that hey these other kids that are here from other schools are in the hogwarts classes like that would have been a really easy tie-in i mean obviously we wouldn't see them from harry's classes but i think a, a quick reference be like hey yeah they're also taking classes um just mention it <laughs> like i don't know well that throws me into the whole like or, yeah 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 we've <laughs> Yeah. Is it is it like if I'm a college soccer player and I'm traveling around the country playing these soccer games at all of these various and then colleges? You just and live I live there the whole year. <laughs> well, kind of, but right. like because I know when I worked in hotels, we would have traveling college teams all the time, mm-hmm. um, and be like, I need a printer, I need Wi-Fi, I need to be able to email my professor. I have this paper due. So even though they weren't in class, they still had to maintain all the work. So were they like remote? learning from their various professors is right. their headmaster mistress taking is there a over flu, all- a flu head in a fire you know like kind of projector right. going on how is the school functioning without their headmaster for an entire year sorry a rabbit hole i'm out yep no we gotta pull back from that one we've we've touched I, on it before i know um i know what, what do you got next okay so we, we get to the the quidditch field and it was like oh it's a thing and harry and cedric are like what did you do? <laughs> oh for, no! For our Quidditch field, and here's the thing: Cedric's a seventh year, right? Why does he care? He'll never play there again. Yeah. So like, but like, they are just livid. And it wasn't until Bagman was like, "Dude, it'll go back to your Quidditch field. It's okay." They're they're like, "Okay, we can we can move on to the next part of this conversation." Yeah. But that was first, right? It, I almost feel like Crumb would be more upset. Like, because that's literally his thing. Like, that's what he does. <laughs> Just like the defilement of the pitch. It seems yeah. like it would irk him a little bit. And also, like, the the group of those five, it just re- it dawned on me, like, wow, okay, four of those five are pretty elite, like, Quidditch players. Like, we don't know. Fleur could be, too. That's what I'm saying. Like, like we, we just know that four out of the five, she absolutely could be. Wait, does that make this competition like biased towards choosing athletes? I would say that certainly could be a yeah, something I could be looking for. But consequence of the way the goblet chooses. Yeah, I would, again, similar to like the sorting hat. Like what? Yeah, at, how are things chosen sometimes by magical Sorry. means? Yeah, as a non-athlete, that bothers me a bit. <laughs> Reasonable. Okay, that's all. Moving on. Moving on. Um. There was a quick mention of the Dursleys, <laughs> just uh, which I guess this is where are we ready to jump into the kind of after May's revelation scene? Uh, so Crumb, it's a maze. we're good. It's a maze. Crumb got the answer right. One word, Crumb nailed it. You know, maze. You're right. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and then Crumb's like, "Hey, Harry, I'd like to have a word with you," and he's all kind of upset about the Hermione thing, which is reasonable, you know, like I, I get where Victor's coming from. And it's very like adult of him to, instead of being mean or making badges, saying Potter stinks, like he goes right to Harry. Just confronts like, him. I want it. And not in a mean way, but yeah. like, I need to talk to you about this. Can we work it out? Let's see what's going on. So. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Like listening to the audio book because it, like in, the two different versions of it, one of them is a little bit more aggressive. Like, I want to know what's between you and Hermione, which is like, I've never, re- mm-hmm. I never read it that way. Um, mm-hmm. Not to like, you know, discount, I think it's the Jim Dale version that, that does it that way. But I could easily see that interpretation of like, you know, he would be a little affronted by what he hears in the news as well. And just like, well, let's just settle this, you know, like, let's just get right to it. But right. I, I, I think either way, when it's on just on print, yeah, take it how you want. <laughs> But uh, clearly they end up being fairly cordial about it. Harry convinces them pretty effectively. We're friends. That's it. Look at all the friends we're having. And um, then Karkaroff shows up, right? I mean, like, 
Crouch, I mean, sorry, yeah, I saw your note that says Karkaroff, and I was like, yeah, that's, no, Crouch. Crouch shows up, and the way he's described is, you know, like, wow, this crazy person, right? And Harry references back to basically the a time he was out with the Dursleys, and it, it says, he reminded Harry vividly of an old tramp he had seen once when out shopping with the Dursleys. That man, too, had been conversing wildly with the air with thin air. Aunt Petunia had seized Dudley's hand and pulled him across the road to avoid him. Uncle Vernon had then retreated the family to a long rant had, had then treated, not retreated, had then <laughs> treated the family to a long rant about what he would like to do with beggars and vagrants. Um it's just a nice like throw in of Hey, remember the Dursleys? Yeah, they're awful. Like, these people that are, you know, downtrodden and, like, didn't ask to be in the situation that they are. Guess what? The worst people that we know, uh, and Snape, but, like, the worst people that we know are just, (laughs) just have such a lack of decency. Like, don't forget about that. But it's just an interesting way of, in the middle of the book, we haven't seen them for 30 chapters. Let's just, let's just put another nail in that coffin. Hey, remember who you hate the most? That's right. The Dursleys. The Dursleys. Pretty much. I mean, there are other people that are worthy of the hate as well, but they're kind of the worst. They're the worst in, like, the, yeah, we see those people all over the place in real life kind of worst. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, that's, I think, why they, they're so relatable, because guess what? Those people are everywhere, and if you're one of them, stop. stop why doing, are you listening to stop, us? Stop, stop doing that. Stop being that person. <laughs> yeah. Don't be that guy. So, little side note on the Dursleys, just throw it in there. Um, but we yeah, do have this sure. this whole scene with Crouch. Uh, any thoughts on that interaction with the the initial striking image that he he kind of shows up with? You know, I really don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like uh, my brain, kind of in my notes. Plus, you know, I have the questions. So I had questions, which yeah. we'll get to some things. But I really jumped to Harry deciding. I need to do something about this. Mm-hmm. That's where my brain really did some processing. I just remember like the first time, and we'll, I'm sure we'll touch on this again in the questions a bit, but I just remember this, this scene being one of those like, wow, this is different. You know, a lot of things in book four have been different than like the standard, oh, Harry Potter chapters. This is like another kind of elevation of the type of story that this is. This is, I would say the only thing as similar to this from a previous book would be like, wow, Sirius Black, broke into the school and slashed the portrait of the fat lady. Like, that's the only thing I can really compare to this kind of reach of security at Hogwarts kind of feeling that we really don't have that much. You know, usually when you're at Hogwarts, I mean, you can't be touched, really. I mean, yeah, there's trolls and basilisks and all these things, but, like, it just feels... Technically, the basilisks live there. That's what I'm saying. Like, the basilisks and trolls, like, there are dangers around, but this one, it just feels... It feels darker, for some reason. I don't know if it's just where we are in the books at this point or what, it's but adults. Right. It just always was more unsettling to me of like, wow, okay. And we've also had this whole book to set up who Crouch is, you know, this tight up straight back kind of tiny well, person yeah. and mm-hmm. clearly just off the off the railroad tracks here. And it something something more and more and more is has been building up and we're starting to see some of that, I think. I agree. Uh, but yeah, Harry does run off to Dumbledore, right? Run, 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 run. And, okay, he's interrupted by your favorite person. Uh... <laughs> do you do you need to do a mini rant? No, Snape's just awful. Like, come on, man. Get out of here. Oh. I love that um, when Harry finally got to Dumbledore, Dumbledore believed Harry right away with no question. Not, a, not even when it was, did you put your name in? He asked calmly. He didn't even have to do that. It was just, let's go. Mm -hmm. And Snape was stupid. Lead the way. Oh, yeah. The headmaster is busy, Potter, said Snape, his thin mouth curling into an unpleasant (laughs) smile. And it's just, like, he's literally doing this because he wants to thwart Harry's whatever Harry's got going on. Like, uh, just, come on, man. Yeah, because it's Harry. Just, I mean. Yeah. I, it's Nape just always has to be not believing Harry no matter what. Yep. Harry could tell Snape was thoroughly enjoying himself, 
denying Harry the thing he wanted when he was so panicky? Just come on, man. You're terrible. You're so, <laughs> you're so dirty. Yes, but Alan Rickman is not terrible. Oh, I love Alan Rickman. He makes that character yeah. so good. And that's why people love him so much. Yes. Okay, so Dumbledore comes, right? And and Crumb was attacked. Crouch is missing. And then various people show up, right? Like Hagrid comes, Karkaroff comes. Moody's Moody just comes. there, yeah. He shows up. <laughs> Hagrid was just there, not really sure why. Like, it, it was really random, the different, well, like... Well, Dumbledore sends off what's, I assume, to be a Patronus to Hagrid's oh, door. Right. Moody says that he ran into Snape. And That's right, so, and Snape told him, and so yeah. the stupid. So we we Snape know down. why they're all there, but they all just kind of get there really quickly. And seemingly. I guess Hagrid must have gotten Karkaroff on his way. Uh, ha uh Dumbledore sends Karkaroff. him off yes. to get him. Yes, and then Hagrid came back. Mm -hmm. Hagrid with, with Karkaroff during Long Bam. Okay. Yep. Um. So you had a note, I thought about. No, you didn't. Okay. So Karkaroff comes, and along with him, he brought his jump to conclusions map. Yep. <sighs> Which is very, very annoying to me because he doesn't actually listen to what had been happening and like all the facts. He hears one thing and then goes on a rant about all the other things he's been mad about for six, eight, nine months and doesn't actually do anything helpful. That's all. You say that one more time. I was distracted by our friend Zachary Tipton showing up. Sorry. <laughs> I was excited. I, I'm excited too, but I can text and talk at the same time. It's I was still thinking about the jump to conclusions map too, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm really glad, or not glad, I'm really annoyed that instead of trying to logically think through what happened, Carker he heard off. a little bit about Crumb being attacked and just went off the deep end with everything he's been mad it's, about. It's, for a, it's a fix, time. it's a setup, yeah, instantly. Which, again, if that's still in the back of his mind, which... I mean, right now, Cedric and Harry are leading in this, and he has done his best to thwart Harry getting any points, right? He gave him a very low score in the first challenge. He did his best to not award points in the second challenge for finishing way outside of the time limit, which, in his case, is fairly reasonable. If only Dumbledore hadn't convinced everyone else of the moral fiber it took. Um, yeah, Crumb would be sitting a lot better. And now... Like Crumb is the one that gets taken down, like for whatever reason. I, it's not unreasonable of Karkaroff to to think there's something amiss. There's, you know, there's something afoot. There's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Exactly. I, not unreasonable, well, I think. I think it's kind of unreasonable. I think his level of reaction is unreasonable. I'm not saying his he His was attacked. I, <laughs> what's he supposed to do? Figure out what happened as opposed to just blame everybody in sight. I mean, he, technically, he just blames Dumbledore. And the okay. government. And the government. I'm fine with blaming the government. <laughs> right, that's, that I was have no problem that was with fine. government blaming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> like, I'm in. However, like, Dumbledore's obviously trying to figure out what the heck just happened, too. Anyway, that goes back to the whole, like, the trolling, right? Just like all of the hate mail Hermione got, just mm -hmm. like all the hate Hagrid got. This is just Karkaroff spouting off at Dumbledore without sort of thinking through what else is going on. Mm -hmm. Seems a little bit of the picture. That's all. Yeah. Okay. What's your last note here? So my last note, it really jumps. Um, Hermione finally ordered the paper. This, this is going to sound so dumb. This was one of the moments the first time I read this book that I was most excited about. God, that, it just sounds so nerdy because I was so tired of Malfoy being, yeah. the, being the newscaster and filtering. See, here we go. Blaming. Now I'm going to blame the media. So Malfoy we, we checked was off the a, government. Now let's hit the media. What's for the next religion? <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yes. Like, basically, Malfoy is the pick your least favorite news station. I would say mine, but it's a family friendly show. So who's the TV? <laughs> it, it, it's the, the news outlet choosing to report on some things. Big and ignore, brother. Just call him big brother. Sure. Ignoring <laughs> other things simply to get a rise out of their target audience. Mm -hmm. This way, Hermione's getting the news from, at least from Malfoy's source. She's taking Malfoy out. Now, I'm not saying that the Daily Prophet is or is not an unbiased. Right. However, it's going to be more reliable than Malfoy. We're cutting so, out one of the middlemen that we know is unreliable. Yes. So I'm very excited that she made that choice. I mean, 
she's a freshman in high school basically getting the newspaper every day but i mean like that's what we do now right it's like clearly everyone school. else is i mean my right. has been getting it i mean it's not that odd <laughs> at this point right. so. so yeah i i was very excited in a nerd way about that yeah how about I, you I, i'm excited that it's a good choice i'm surprised it took her this long to be frustrated enough with it uh but it fits you know especially with how much of a thing it's become in this book before it was just like oh like who cares like not a big deal these are more like personal attacks that are happening in the news for the first time so and malfoy's part of the news like yeah he's giving interviews yeah that's true bad bottle flower worm come on get out of town anyway oh, um, because we are the number nerds um i just wanted to point out another quick line that said that karkaroff brought a dozen students the only Where was that? uh let's see it may have been when he was talking to when crumb was talking to harry you think i just have it ready to go this is what i get for taking notes how dare you <laughs> you know what i'll just type in the word dozen you are here made a round dozen okay I think I have it here. And now it disappeared. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's it's whenever uh, Crouch is is losing his mind and he's kind of thinking Weatherby is there and he's rattling off, you know, a couple of conversations they've had previously. And now oh, where did the actual line go? Do you, do you have it? it? Okay. Yeah. Now that you said that, I was one page away. Here yeah. we go. And then send another owl to Madame Maxine because she might want to up the number of students she's bringing now. Karkaroff's made it a round dozen. Do that, Weatherby, will you? Will you? Will? Right. So if we're going to take that as canon, as a true number, which I would believe the banker looking Mr. Crouch on his numbers, that it was likely actually 12 that, that Karkaroff was bringing. The only other number that we have that was ever given of how many students showed up was barely 20 it's earlier in the book we talked about how there's only barely 20 more students in the school but it felt a lot more full it, you know it felt a lot more crowded in certain areas i could see 24 feeling like uh, being estimated at 20 ish barely 20 being 24 i don't know i don't know i feel like it's not a math person yeah i don't know it we have to look at the numbers. That's what we're here for. So uh, I just thought it was worth pointing out that the last number that we were given on that was, we'll say 20-ish. <laughs> so I guess my point is, like, at worst case, it seems like Bobaton showed up with eight students. and Or Durham, nine. Right, eight or nine, and Durmstrang showed up with 12. So I just wanted to bring it, you know, we have another number to talk about. Right. <laughs> Not really anything else to it. Let's play that music. Let's let's, let's stop this. <laughs> All right, Melissa. Every chapter we have a couple of questions, and do you have any for me? And are they burning? I have a lot, and they're smoldering. Smoldering questions. I think we see a bonus question in there if we want it. <laughs> And, and here's the thing. Some of the questions have multi-parts. Oh, yeah. All right. We're, we're question heavy. There's a lot of things going on in this chapter. There's a lot. Okay. So for each one, I'm going to give all the parts. Yeah. Just do the whole thing and we'll chit-chat through it. Okay. Should we start worrying about Winky yet? Because she's drinking too much. And then what kind of secrets is Winky keeping for Crouch? Oh, man. Uh, I want to say, yeah, we should start worrying about her. She's clearly at wit's end. Um, they say, you know, wow, that stuff's not very strong, but it's really strong for a house elf. Like, it's, I think it's becoming an issue and not in like a, oh, wow, it's embarrassing. I, I think it could turn into something that's really unhealthy for her. And that's, that's not good. Um, what do you think on that? I am really concerned about her. I think she needs to go talk to a professional. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm not even joking. I am really worried about her state of mental health. Yeah. Because when was the first time they actually went down into the kitchen? Do you remember what time of the school year that was? Was that before the Yule Ball? I think it wasn't that long ago. It was um, before the Yule Ball, right after the first test. So... Okay. So maybe November or so? Yeah. Because I think the first well, I mean, test was I mean, in like then, October. It's, it's like... This chapter covered a lot of months. Yeah. So this is anywhere from Easter to the end of May. Right. So I guess my point of uh, the Quidditch World Cup happened just a couple months before that interaction. So, like, I could understand, like, the grief and still 
having a hard time. Like, maybe they just got to Hogwarts, and, like, that was, like, newer getting used to your new surroundings, so, like, that'd be really tough on her and all this, but, like, it's several months past now, and it's getting worse. It, it's not, it doesn't, it's not heading, you know, up. It seems like it's just getting worse. And is anybody noticing? They just throw a towel over her, right? I mean, just, just cover her up because they don't want to deal with it. Right. So, I mean, like, humans. Yeah, I don't know what kind of oversight there is on the house elf, uh, I guess the castle elf uh, community. See, we would go back to Hermione's point of they're not treated as beings, they're treated as just lower, and therefore mm -hmm. nobody's taking their welfare. Seriously, you know, or taking responsibility for it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. awful. And like, oh. in my head canon, it would almost seem like Filch would be kind of responsible for kind of caring for them right like it's almost or like being their um superior kind of thing like that's his department um which oh. would be like the worst boss ever right like ever right i mean it, so I, I don't think there's any support for her in the castle no okay what kind of <laughs> what kind of secrets could she be keeping oh, yeah. i mean we know i'm trying to make sure i can remember what we know at this point um we know that Crouch really doesn't like dark wizards, right? I mean, that's... Mm. But I don't know. Like his wife died, so he doesn't have anybody else. So maybe, like, maybe she was his companion, you know? He, she was the person he'd just come home and talk to. And mm -hmm. so she knows stuff about, like, work. Was, because, yeah. And, sorry, keep, keep going, because I, I, I very much agree with you. Yeah, that was kind of the end of my thought. Yeah, and, it, like, if you think better. of her perspective, like, he is her world. Right, that's he is everything in her universe, and so like even like the minor stuff that he would come home and just vent about at work would probably seem like big, big deals to Winky, right? Because that's probably the only person she ever talked to when they were at home. So yeah, so if you're like venting about somebody or something at work, and you're doing that to somebody, she's like, hey, just don't tell anybody, you know, like a like the blow off. Yeah, like, like let's. I, it's fine. Like, don't just be venting. Like, this doesn't need to get out because obviously it'll hurt some people's feelings or it could like mess up stuff. Yeah. He just says that like a, and she takes it as like Bible. Right. And like along with that, like, say I was wronged and like I tell you about it, your anger towards that is probably going to be more than mine on in certain cases. I'm not making a specific oh, reference I, at all, but uh, yeah. Yeah, like, I, I, I can, I can see, assume that would happen. Like, from Winky's perspective, like, anything that's, like, a slight towards Mr. Crouch, she feels ownership because that's her Crouch, right? And, yes. like, so, like, that, I can see if maybe that has a part to it as well. Um, so, and she's also bottling that up, and I, we've talked a lot about this, but it's a good topic because I think we should very much be worried about Winky and nobody, nobody is going to talk about it. No one else is except for maybe Hermione. Right. But she doesn't, I don't think she knows enough to know what parts to worry about. She just knows to worry, she's, which is good. She's taking a very global worry about the entire race, which is again, very, very valid. Yes. Helpful. Where, but not in this exact, like she's looking out for the large. The population. You do that. You might lose individuals mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah, I think if she put a little more time into focusing on Winky, you can get that vote on your boat. Not yep. a bad, not a bad way to go into what she's working yep. towards. All right, question two. <laughs> question two. <laughs> also a two-parter. Right. How surprised were you about the leprechaun gold disappearing? And how surprising is it that Harry never noticed it missing? I definitely don't think it's very surprising. It very much reminds me of, like, the fool's gold, you know, that we have here in the muggle world of, like, yeah, it looks like gold, but it's it's not. So it's, it's like a magical version of that is how I take it. Um, okay. And it also, I like bringing in the idea of more of the leprechaun. It, just the idea of the leprechaun gold mythology stuff is really neat. Like, even if you catch the leprechaun, you get his gold. Guess what? It's not going to be worth much because... You're terrible for catching this person or this entity that's just trying to do what they do. Uh, right. So I think there's things built into that, which is which are neat. Um, I don't think it's surprising at all that Harry doesn't notice because how many things has he bought since then? Like very little. Like he doesn't like walk around with pocket money. Um, they're not sure. out like spending all the time. And even if he did, it's not like he marks specific time, like specific coins. Like, well, this is the coin that I got here. This is and, like it's. They're not out shopping all the time. And, and, and 
like, let's be honest, Harry's bag of money is not so skint that right. he would notice a handful disappearing. Which is exactly Ron's point for sure. And Right. And I'm not discounting Ron's disbelief. I just, I'm not surprised Harry didn't notice. I was surprised that the leprechaun quilt disappeared. That was kind of a twist on it that I wasn't expecting the first time I read it. Yeah, I definitely, I, I say not surprised. I I was surprised when it happened, but like when it was like, oh, that's neat. You know, like I, I enjoyed it. Yes. I enjoyed that fact is, I guess, a better way of stating what I what I meant. Okay. Question three. Is it surprising? There's a lot of surprised questions. <laughs> is it surprising that Crumb is threatened by Harry's relationship with Hermione? Um, I mean, it's not like they've ever really talked, right? I mean, right. and he does, Crumb does see Harry with her all the time. Yes, Ron is also there. Like, I think most of the time, like, you see that, but still, then you get this, in his, all, all Crumb knows, I don't know if he's dealt with Rita Skeeter much, I mean, it's not like she's written about him that we know of specifically, so that he would have any kind of, you know, point of discredibility towards her. He doesn't know the people that she writes about, because it's, it seems to be all local, and so without that, it's, oh, this credible, well-known news source, or, you know, this well-known reporter is stating this, like... It's kind of one of those ignorance likely leads you down the wrong path, um, even if it is bliss. Um, so I, I'm surprised that he's threatened. And again, it, it comes down to how the, the audiobook narration goes on how you take his initial uh, kind of breach, broaching the subject with it, I guess, too. What about you? Um, I like Harry's disbelief of like, 18-year-old international Quidditch star. The, the world-famous Crumb. Because Harry doesn't think of himself as the world-famous Harry Potter, like, right. ever. I mean, it almost seems like some of those memes that you see of Mark Ruffalo, who is so excited to meet all these famous people. There's literally a meme that says, it's like Mark Ruffalo forgot that he's all so famous. Okay, yeah. That's what this moment reminds me of, of just like, oh, ooh, somebody famous. Oh, ooh, somebody famous. <laughs> Tap, tap, tap. Uh, dude, you are too. Yeah, I would yeah, rather yeah. have that reaction, though, than, oh, just too cool for school. Like, meet another famous... Like, be cool. Right. With, like, be excited about that. That's, that's cool mean, stuff. Don't get me wrong. Mark Ruffalo is one of my favorites. And has been pre-Marvel Universe. I just want to oh, throw yeah. it out there. I hardly but, knew he... I don't watch Marvel movies, and I like him for things he was in well before that, so... There you go. I think that's kind of Harry's thing. Like, I'm just little old me, and here is this, like, amazing almost adult who is seeing me as an equal... L literally adult. adult. <laughs> literally yeah, right. adult in the wizarding world <laughs> and not even equal because of the champion thing but like in the realm of girls which i mean let's be honest harry is still like on on the level of the at the end of the movie inside out where the main character talks to a boy and the boys all the emotions inside the boy's head is just going girl 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 <laughs> they're freaking out like that's about where harry's at in that kind of world so i like that yeah. was i surprised no, but I, I just like that it's very... Well done. It's, it's a really yeah. good really good scene, for sure. Okay, so here goes question four. Who is the his that Crouch asks Harry about? Are you his? Is that yes. the line? Yes. Um, or it's like, you're not his. I think it's something like that. I yeah, you're that. not his. And then Harry says no. And then Crouch asks Dumbledore's? That's right, said Harry. Whatever that means. Hmm. Warn Dumbledore. And so I, with with how out of sorts he is, you know, I to me, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to jump to, you know, Voldemort. Like something is going on with Voldemort, who we know has been lurking behind the scenes mm -hmm. here and there. Harry's had dreams about him. And so I don't know what is really going on with that. But I when you hear his in a context like this, it just makes me think, well, it's got to be some something involved with Lord Voldemort's. I mean, really, if Dumbledore is the opposite, who's the opposite of Dumbledore? Yeah, exactly, right. And we've been told since the very first chapter, you know, you're the one he's most afraid of. So, okay, I vote Dumbledore, too. I, I, mean, I'll go with that. You mean Voldemort? But oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, probably, it's probably Dumbledore. <laughs> you're not his, are you? No, 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 I'm not. You're Dumbledore's? Yeah, now I'm it's confused. Evil, it's his evil twin brother. <laughs> Rumble <Dumbledore>. Roar. <laughs> Pig farts. Pig farts on the moon. Did somebody say Drago Malfoy? <laughs> oh man, go. If, 
floor. Go watch a very Potter musical right after this. Just do it. Oh. Go go watch it again. It's it's awesome. Um, all right, question number five. Are we? Is that we're on five yet? <laughs> five. I have a bonus sixth question also. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start with a question. I'm gonna go with the bonus question. It's chronologically in order. Why would Crouch attack Crumb? Is it really just madness? I mean, like, what's he doing there, right? Like, why is he showing up right now in the ground? It's not like he showed up like in the castle. He's out in the woods, in the woodses, in the woods, in the woodsies. Like, what's he That's doing right. out there? Um, like he's again clearly off his rocker. He's as our good friend. Ron Weasley would say, he's mental. Um, I, I think something's clearly happened and he's seems to be mentally broken. You know, I it just, things are not, synapses are not firing the right way. Sometimes they are though. And that's, a, you know, later on where it's just kind of like, Harry has to take it seriously. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. wow, this is all just gibberish. Like some of it's clearly referencing back to not knowing where he's at, but there are certainly times where something seems to click and he is warning Harry about, you know, whatever's going on. And so I think it's kind of a combination. You know, I I, I think, I, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I, I think Crumb, or not a Crumb, Crouch attacking Crumb could not have happened in one of his lucid moments. Correct. Right, 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 right. I, I, it could have happened in one of his moments of confusion, mm -hmm. if you will, but I, I don't think it was done purposefully. Crouch uses confusion. That's a Pokemon joke. You wouldn't get it. It's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say a Pokemon joke? I did. And it was fair at best. Yeah. No. Thank you. You weren't the audience for it. Good. I don't want to be. All right. Can I do my bonus question six? Yes. Okay. Why does Dumbledore want Harry to stay in the tower and not send any owls? I think, I mean, you could probably read into it a little bit more on, you know, trying to contain communication lines and, you know, ensuring who knows what at what time, Dumbledore kind of controlling the situation of it. But I really think it just comes out to Dumbledore doing everything he can to protect Harry. You know, thing, this is this is way out of whack. Like, what is Crouch doing here? Like, where did he go? Where did he go? Albus, number one priority, take care of the student. And he puts Hagrid in charge of getting Harry up to the castle again, which is smart. I mean, I, I would trust Hagrid with that. It's the same thing in book one, chapter one. Like, guess what? Hagrid's going to be good at this. This is his thing. And um, It's like what he does. It's, it's kind of like right up his alley. <laughs> and <laughs> like, I think it's a, a smart move to say, you know, I, I know what you're thinking. Like, I know you want to go tell Sirius about this. It can wait. Like, okay, like, it's it's fine. Um, just go somewhere that I can guarantee your safety is how I take it. Okay, I agree. I, that's kind of what I was thinking of. You need to stay there because there is where I know you can't get hurt. Right, right. Yeah, you explained it better, but that was it. Well, thanks. All right, so we, uh, every chapter we talk about our favorite things, and we call it our chapter superlatives. Melissa, what was your favorite line? Professor, said Harry, sidestepping Snape, before Snape could speak. Mr. Crouch is here. He's down in the forest. He wants to speak to you. Harry expected Dumbledore to ask questions, but to his relief, Dumbledore did nothing of the sort. Lead the way, he said promptly. <laughs> For multiple reasons. One, totally stepping over Snape. Good move, right? All for it. And lead the way. Don't. Right? No qualifications needed. I believe you implicitly because you wouldn't show up like this. Nope. If you were pulling my chain. Like that's just, okay, this is urgent. Let's take care of it. Yes. I very much like that line as well. Okay. My favorite line, I, I have a couple. I'm just going to go with, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick honorable mention of, Move, Harry shouted at it. Come on. But nothing at Hogwarts had mo ever moved just because you shouted at it. He knew it was no good. So just a, a quick little funny there. Um, but I'm going to go with uh, when Harry and Crumb are talking. Um, and Crumb starts with, you have never, you have not? No, said Harry very firmly. Crumb looked slightly happier. He stared at Harry for a few seconds, then, then said, you fly very well. I was watching at the first task. Thanks, said Harry, grinning broadly, and suddenly 
feeling much taller himself. I saw you at, I saw you at the Quidditch World Cup. The Ronsky Fang. You really. And then it goes into the whole crouch thing. But just them kind of coming to terms, being adults about this nonsense gossip stuff, talking it out, and then just being equals, you know? And Harry needs that because he's famous. But this is something he's getting praised for, for just actual skill that he has, not for who he is. And that means so much more to him than anyone else show, showing up and just gawking at his scar. By someone who has an equal level of fame, by someone who, by all rights, should not treat Harry like an equal because Harry is the young kid. Right. You know what I mean? Who who um, entered the entered the tournament inappropriately, who mm-hmm. threw off the balance, who, you know, isn't old enough and isn't like, nope, you're just one of the champions and you're good at these things. And like Crumb and Harry really, Crumb probably is the best person for Harry to, to treat Harry like an equal because nobody else has all those same weird things Mm -hmm. besides Crumb, who's still kid-like. Yeah. And down to earth with it, which is what we've seen over and over and over again. It's the fame or whatever doesn't go to his head. We've never seen him be bigger than life crumb. And he is so shy. Like It's just, I yeah. I really liked that scene between them. It was very short, but I, I thought it was really, really strong character moment for sure. Yep. So who are you going to crown the chapter MVP? Ironic, based on the last conversation, or not ironic, but probably predictable. Um, I'm going with crumb. Mm-hmm. Both for that scene, for treating Harry like an equal, also for like not kind of freaking out with Crouch, like letting Harry take the lead and like Harry knew what to do. And he was like, okay, I'll do this. Like they both were just sort of, you know, spring into action mode, but also because he nailed the maze, like he's out. Yeah. There's some brain here that we don't get to see a lot because of the famous athlete and the silent, shy demeanor. But I mean, he obviously knows a lot in order to have gotten that far. So, mm. yep, it's a crumb win. I absolutely think you picked the right character for the chapter MVP. Um, I didn't see that, so you picked I was hoping I could pick it for my honorable mention. Um, but I'm glad that you did, uh-huh. and I will... I think there's a lot of really strong character moments in this chapter, though. Hagrid has several really good ones. He's got a couple not as great <laughs> ones. Like it, there's, a, It's, like, questionable at I the very, very... Not a he would say, if you make a bad mistake... Like, that, that takes you out, right? Right. <laughs> but it's a little harsher than we are, though, I think. Um, Ron has some good parts. He has some down parts. Like, it's it's offsetting penalties. Uh, <laughs> neutral at the end. Um, yes. I'm going to... I'm going to go with Albus Dumbledore. I think probably I need to go with the full tally on who we've always listed these. I need to do that. That needs to happen. Uh, maybe after Game of Thrones is done, I'll, I'll go through and update all that. Stop um, giving yourself things to do. Right. Oh, I'm really good at uh, putting things on the to-do list. Um, yes, you are. But Albus Dumbledore is is going to get the honorable mention specifically for your favorite line. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we, we alternated. Your favorite line is my honorable mention. My favorite yeah. line was your chapter MVP. So... Perfect. Um, I think that's exactly well done. Um, good, good Albus uh, interaction here. Just good job, it, it multitasking so well on like kind of assessing the situation, regardless of trusting Harry and getting down there and hitting on Snape, which is always a plus in my book. Uh, gets down there and just like assesses the situation, sends off for Hagrid, has like multiple things going on, and knows exactly what pieces he needs to move around to help get things into a let's figure out what's going on and doesn't lose sight of needing to protect Harry, right? Or Crumb even. And it's it's just it's just really, really strong when you see uh, Albus in this, yeah, this is kind of why he's elite <laughs> kind of thing. So good, good stuff. And that wraps up chapter number 28. Yay! I almost forgot the number, but I didn't. <laughs> Good job reading. Nice so job. Me. You're on fire right now. Ooh. So we are going to end this particular chapter's discussion. You can continue that discussion on Twitter at Not Name Podcast. You can send us your owls and other questions at notnamepodcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, thepodcastthat.com, where you can find this show and all of our shows that we create at the podcast, that family of podcasts, click on the support us link 
scroll down and click on our show's logo. That'll take you to our Amazon affiliate link where you can find a plethora of specially curated Harry Potter items. What's that to- store called? It is called all students must have a number two pewter cauldron because it's your class list, right? School Heck supply yeah. list. Summer's coming up. Start shopping now. Get your favorite Harry Potter paraphernalia from Amazon. You buy it through Amazon. We get a kickback. You're going to buy it anyway. Everybody loves Harry Potter stuff. After you do that, make sure you do hit that subscribe button on iTunes and on YouTube. Leave us a rating there or a comment. We love hearing from you. Um, what do you like? What do you dislike? What's What was your funniest part? S- send in some fan mail. We would love that. Uh, or your fan fix. You know, it's uh, it's all fun and games until someone sends in a fan fix. Yeah, that too. <laughs> um, another way you can support us is listening to this not named podcast on Radio Public. It is free, it is easy to use, and it helps listeners just like you find and support shows just like this one. Um, and all the shows at thepodcast.com. When you listen to our show on Radio Public's Android or iOS app, literally everyone benefits. Join us next time when we talk about Chapter 29. The dream. Stay imaginary. Thanks. All right. Uh, we want to do the next one? Let's do the next well, one I'm getting sleepy. Yeah, let's do the yeah. next one later. Got, you've got a hockey game I've to got go to watch the Blues game. I've got to watch the Blues game. All right. Well, uh, Zachary and Gia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. As always, you guys are champs, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.